Welcome to our live stream. Similarities and differences between the female and male athlete. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kai Taylor and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this live stream technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using your computer volume settings. For closed captions, click the CC icon in the bottom right hand corner of the video player. Select English to enable closed captions. You will need to enter your first name and last name to participate in polls or to ask a poll question. To ask a question, click on the text box and type your question. When finished, press the enter or the paper airplane icon to send the question. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your question will be responded to in the order in which they are received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We are joined today by our speaker, Dr. Samara Friedman. Dr. Friedman is board certified by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, who practices at the Pediatric Orthopedic Center in Cedar Knolls and Springfield, New Jersey. She specializes in pediatric and adolescent trauma, growth deformities, and treatment of sports injuries, including arthroscopic treatment of the shoulder, elbow, knee, and ankle injuries. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our speaker, Dr. Samara Friedman, for opening remarks. The floor is yours. Good evening. So I've been asked to speak on the similarities and differences between the female and male athlete. So I'm going to start with a little bit of the similarities. There aren't too many. Um, both men and women are highly dedicated to their sport. Um, they both train extensively and work with coaches and development on um, really reaching the highest levels in their respective sports. They're focused and they're, they both have extreme perseverance. Um, however, within that, there are still some, some differences. The female athlete, particularly as they get into high school, they have less fan support, you know, middle school and younger, you've got your parents coming, but when you get into high school sports and it's more, uh, classmates and friends and, uh, newspaper coverage, it becomes more about the male athlete, but yet the female athletes still persist and still dedicate themselves. There are fewer role models for the female athlete. Um, there are fewer coaches that are uh, female. So you'll find quite a few men coaching in women's sports, but you don't find nearly as much women coaching in on male teams, despite there being absolutely no reason why they can't fulfill fill that role. There are notable exceptions, um, particularly in baseball right now. Um, Rachel Balkovic is the um, manager of the Tampa Bay Tarpoons, uh, the Yankees um, um, minor league affiliate. Um, Kim Eng is the GM of the Miami Marlins. So things are changing and they are changing for the better. Um, but also in the professional athlete world, women get less pay than um, their counterparts. So the differences, of course, are always in the genes. Um, difference, a lot of physiologic differences um, exist that affect sports performance. Um, men have higher oxygen carrying capacity, and part of that is due to an average um, lung volume that is larger in men than in women. Much of that is due to height. So there is going to be variability where a woman may have larger um, lung capacity than a man, but on average, men have larger lung capacities, also have higher hemoglobin, globin, and also have a, therefore a higher VO2 max, which is the use of oxygen by the muscles. Um, males have longer and larger bones, and that gives them a mechanical leverage um, with greater leverage in performing athletic competition. Um, there are exceptions to that in gymnastics. Um, being smaller is helpful because there's 
less body to rotate around very quickly. And so girls do have an advantage in um, gymnastics in particular. Um, the wider pelvis in females um, makes the center of gravity lower. And that also gives an advantage in terms of balance, which is more helpful in some sports than in, in others. Um, males have a higher um, muscle mass to weight ratio. So on average, men are stronger than women once going through puberty. Um, however, interestingly, if you look at muscles in cross section and a female versus a male, and they have the same cross section of their muscle in terms of width length, um, they will have the same strength. So it's really the larger musculature due to testosterone that confers the improved strength. Women do have their advantages too. Females are more efficient in converting glycogen to energy. So glycogen is a secondary fuel source that's used in endurance activities. So not just marathon running where the women's times are getting closer and closer to men's times. But if you really look at your ultra long marathons, um, women and men sometimes compete together. If you look at your very long distance swims, women and men might compete together. And women also, because of their slightly higher percentage of uh, body fat, also have an advantage in using less energy to stay afloat when swimming. Um, females also fatigue slower in isometric muscle contraction. So if a woman and a man is mat matched for strength, the male muscle will fatigue faster and women have faster muscle recovery. And we know estrogen plays a role in muscle repair and regeneration. It's just not entirely clear uh, the exact mechanism for that. So sports participation and the degree of participation in, by girls and women has gone up 900% um, since 1972 with the passing of Title IX. Now, Title, Title IX prohibits discrimination based on sex um, for any school or educational program that receives federal funding. Um, Congressman John Tower in 1972 or 1971 proposed an amendment that would have exempted athletic participation from that. Um, that amendment was actually rejected, but it actually led to this misunderstanding that Title IX is a sports equity law, uh, when in reality, sports is just a part of it and it's an educational equality law. So with that huge increase in participation of girls and women in sports, we have seen a concomitant increase in ACL anterior cruciate ligament injuries. So the ACL is a primary stabilizer of the knee. It prevents anterior translation of the uh, tibia underneath the femur and stabilizes rotation as well. Um, the PCL, which is another main ligament of the knee, in contrast, prevents posterior tibial translation, but not as much rotational support. So most athletes will actually be able to continue sports with non-operative treatment of a PCL tear, but the same is not quite for the ACL tear. You also, if you're looking at the diagram, um, the, you have the MCL on the medial side of the knee and the LCL on the outer side of the knee or lateral side of the knee. So there are approximately 100 to 200,000 ACL tears per year in the United States, greater than 50,000 surgeries per year, which honestly I thought would have been uh, higher. And that will vary based on the study you read. High school female athletes contribute 20,000 to 80,000 ACL tears per year. And over 70% of that is sports related. So the number of ACL tears per 100,000 person years increased by 2.5% per year in females versus 2.2% per year in males, um, six, ages six to 18 over a 20 year period. And a study in sports medicine in 2022 found that the incidence of non-contact ACLs where you're not colliding with another player was 0.14 per 1,000 player hours in women 
versus 0 0.05 per 1,000 player hours in men, which is a substantial difference, about three times the rate in, in women. So the ACL injuries are most commonly seen from age 15 to 40, um, most often in pivoting sports. And with pivoting, it tends to be a non-contact injury. So a lot of times when I see somebody in my office with a knee injury, um, they don't necessarily appreciate that just because they didn't collide with someone doesn't mean that they couldn't have torn their ACL. And in fact, about 55% of ACL tears are from non-contact injuries. So they pivoted the wrong way, their cleat got stuck, and it's the twisting or turning of the knee, the valgus of the knee that results in that type of injury. Um, the playing surface does in fact make a difference. So on turf, there is a 1.39 times higher rate of ACL tears than on grass. A previously torn ACL will also put you at risk. Um, once you've torn your ACL, there's about a 10% chance of a re-tear, and that's a similar number in both um, female and male athletes. There's also a 20% risk of tearing the contralateral ACL, and that's on average, but it's slightly higher in girls and lower in boys. And High school versus college, as expected, the love as the level of participation increases in our intensity, so does the rate of ACL tears. So 5.5 versus 15 in high school versus college for 100,000 athletic exposures. And in general, depending on what study you read, women are anywhere from two to eight times um, higher risk. And that risk will actually vary by sport. So the female to male ACL tear incidence ratios are 3.5 in basketball, 2.67 times more in soccer, and 1.18 times more in lacrosse. And girls soccer out of any sport has the highest rate of ACL tears, and this is followed by uh, boys football. Um, baseball had the least number of tears in nine sports studied by Joseph et al. in the Journal of Athletic Training in 2022. So again, depending on the study, girls, uh, young women, two to eight times more likely to tear their ACL than males in similar sports. And there are a number of different theories to explain this gender difference. So what you're looking at here is an arthroscopic view of an ACL. And on the left, this is an intact ACL. This is the direction the fibers should be going towards the lateral femoral condyle. And if you follow my arrow on the other picture, you're looking at a torn ACL. There are some fraying of the fibers. It's no longer attached to that uh, wall of the lateral femoral condyle. And uh, this is an ACL that is incompetent at that point in time. The ACL sits in an anatomic area called the notch. And the notch is the area between the medial and femoral condyles. The PCL is also in that notch. And so there are some anatomic neuromuscular and hormonal differences between boys, girls, men, women that contribute to this increased incidence of ACL tears. So some of the anatomic factors include an increased Q angle. The Q angle is an angle that is drawn by the intersection of two lines. Those two lines are one from starting from the center point of the patella and going up to the anterior superior iliac spine of the pelvis. The other line is from the center of the patella down to the tibial tubercle. The women on average have a higher Q angle than men and the more 
um, the higher your Q angle, the more valgus there is at the knee. Um, and as you will discuss shortly, that valgus plays in a role, plays a role in that risk for ACL tears. Um, women also have a narrower notch. Um, the notch again being that area where the ACL and PCL run. And notch width does appear to be a factor um, in some studies, although there is conflicting studies that a smaller notch, which is what women have, um, does confer some increased risk of ACL tear. Some women actually have, rather than an upside down U-shaped notch, have more of like a, an A-shaped notch. And that is something that we do address during ACL reconstruction surgery. We will shave down some of that bone to more normalize the notch. Um, girls and women have a smaller uh, size to their ACL. However, there's no conclusive correlation between ACL size and risk of sustaining an ACL tear. Um, there is increased ligamentous laxity in, in girls and women, and there tends to be an increased tibial slope, which does confer, again, a risk of tearing the ACL. The increased tibial slope is the sort of angle, if you were to draw a line up the tibial shaft and a line across the tibial plateau, that tibial plateau may be angled uh, more so in women than in men and more so in some people than in others. So it's not at a 90 degree uh, angle to the, to the shaft. So there are also neuromuscular factors uh, at play here. And the, um, there is different muscle activation in girls and boys during cutting and pivoting sports. And that's not really surprising when you consider the anatomical differences, the wider pelvis, shorter femurs, bigger Q angle, the limbs do have different construction and it would therefore make sense to some sense that the muscles would activate differently in athletic movement. There's higher pivoting instability in women versus men, diminished proprioception, which is sort of the feedback your brain gets as to where your uh, joints are in space. And particularly significant is that valgus landing. So girls and women tend much more so than men to land with their knees converging, putting them into a valgus position. And if you look at these little skeletons at the bottom here, you can see the skeleton that's landing correctly. The femur are, the femurs are essentially parallel. The one that is landing incorrectly, they're converging. And you can see here with these two um, soccer players where one's knee is kind of falling more into valgus, the hip is dropping and that puts more, um, uh, more valgus force onto the knee and it makes it more likely to get into an unsafe position where you're putting yourself at higher risk for tearing the ACL. So the hormonal factors are also somewhat um, controversial. The studies that have demonstrated a difference in timing of ACL tear in relationship to the menstrual cycle have had relatively weak evidence. But when you do look at multiple studies together, you find that most of these studies are finding an increased rate of ACL tears towards the follicular and ovulatory stages of the menstrual cycle um, compared to the luteal cycle. So the first two weeks after menstruation is slightly uh, higher risk. Again, the evidence for that is relatively weak. It's not high powered studies. Testosterone makes a difference, particularly the lack thereof in women, because any increased muscular strength helps to support the joints, helps to um, cushion your landing and be able to control your joints in space. Um, and that testosterone, of course, confers that high increased muscular strength. Um, there was a Danish registry study, interestingly, that did show a 20% risk reduction in ACL injuries in females who took oral contraceptives. So in terms of treatment and their, and the outcomes, there are, of course, big, for the same reasons that they got themselves into this trouble in the first place, there are in slightly inferior results after ACL 
reconstruction. There are worse uh, functional outcome scores, um, a diminished, slightly diminished inability to return to sports. Um, females are 1.4 times less likely to return to their pre-injury level of sports than males. Um, there's a little more post-operative knee laxity, um, slightly higher rate of graft failure, and a higher rate of contralateral ACL injury. Um, and 24 to 30% of adolescent females that did sustain uh, another ACL injury did so within uh, two years of uh, their surgical uh, reconstruction. And we found a later return to sports will diminish that risk of re-injury or contralateral injury. So the prevention takes into account at least the risk factors that mo are modifiable, which there aren't many, um, into training programs to help minimize the risk of ACL tears. So this is focused, you can't really affect the hormones, although um, apparently you can as per that Danish registry, but I don't know that that's a good enough reason to start on an oral contraceptive. Um, but anatomic factors you cannot affect. Neuromuscular though, that you can have an impact on in training. And this is really focused on that 55% of non-contact injuries, because if you're sustaining a non-contact injury, it's how your body moved in space. And so you might be able to modify that and lower your risk of injury. Contact injuries where somebody collides with you, that's a much less controlled thing where you really won't be able to um, adjust your risk of sustaining that type of injury. So the neuromuscular training programs focus on safer movement patterns to reduce risk during landing, pivoting. They focus on plyometrics, balance training, flexibility, strengthening. And the risk reduction is actually the greatest for your teenage females and can go up to as high as 75 to 100% uh, relative risk reduction. So the components of an ACL injury prevention program um, are as, essentially as follows. It should be done for 10 minutes, three times a week, approximately for eight weeks, and then a maintenance after that. Um, it should be implemented before the start of the season so that they can essentially be ready to go when the season starts. Um, a good way to implement it is as a warm up, um, not at the end of a, of a practice. Um, maintenance is important as well. And it needs to include um, neuromuscular and proprioceptive training. Again, proprioceptive is where your, your joints are in space, plyometrics, agility, balance, and core strengthening. And even implementing just one of those factors can diminish risk of ACL tears by 17%. This is a low cost and easy, essentially easy to impl implement. Um, sometimes it's also helpful, particularly if someone's seeing a physical therapist, to identify players that are at risk who might need um, more intensive training or intervention. And one of the, one of the ways that that can be done is via the drop vertical test. And what that is, is somebody is gonna be standing on a platform, maybe about 30 to 50 um, centimeters off the ground. And what they do is they jump down and then do a vertical leap straight up in the air. And this is generally videotaped in slow motion via a cell phone. And you look at how much valgus are those knees going into. And the worse the valgus, the higher uh, risk. So in the 1990s, apparently, as per Seinfeld, and yes, this was actually an episode that I saw, um, boys get atomic wedgies and girls, thanks to their classmates, get eating disorders. And there is unfortunately some, some truth in that, that there are societal pressures that contribute to eating disorders. And that's what uh, leads me into the next topic that I want to address, where there's a significant difference between males and females. And that is in relative energy deficiency in sport, or RED-S, formerly known as the female triad. And in 2014, the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, 
published a consensus statement beyond the female athlete triad to address uh, the impairment in physiologic function in both female and male athletes who were limited in their sports by low energy availability or LEA. Um, this causes not just the stress fractures and the disordered menses um, and the disordered eating in the female athlete triad. It addresses all the issues that can be seen in someone who does not have adequate caloric intake for their respective sport. So you get impaired physiologic function directly from low energy availability. Um, it can affect metabolic rate, menstrual function, bone health, immunity, protein synthesis, cardiovascular health, and most significantly, at least to the athlete, impair their ability to really reach their maximum um, ability to um, progress in their, in their respective sport. So the issue is really the balance between available energy and energy demand. So when you're taking in enough calories and nutrients for all your baseline life processes and for your training for sports, then everything is balanced and you do not develop red S. If there is diminished availability of calories because they've altered their eating, as an example, then the energy demand is higher than the energy available and you start developing potential signs or symptoms of red S. Likewise, if there's an excessive training load, even if the calories are the same, but sometimes they are also diminished, then again, that puts you out of um, balance. So this will result in diminished muscle strength, diminished endurance, uh, increased risk of in injury, um, decreased response to training. It can cause impaired judgment, decreased coordination, decreased concentration. So as the energy intake is diminished, the body goes into energy saving mode and the metabolic rate will diminish as well. Um, and sometimes weight loss can actually be a later finding because of that change in metabolism. So some of the signs include either disordered eating or eating a full-on eating disorder. Um, there can, can, of course, be um, an abnormally low uh, body fat percentage, um, abnormal menses, reduced um, bone mineral density. And this is a diagnosis of exclusion. It's suggested by the diminished growth um, is someone who's still growing, diminished weight, is suggested by altered menses. Um, and certainly if there's an eating disorder of comp component that is highly suggestive of it in someone who is engaging in sports. So you'll see weight loss, lack of normal growth, endocrine dysfunction, recurrent injuries, illnesses, diminished performance, and it well, will in, uh, affect mood um, as well. So the orthopedic uh, pathologies are, can be varied. It's not just the you know, classic stress fracture. It can be any type of you know, overuse injury where the ability to repair the soft tissues or bone is impaired. So there can be stress fractures, of course, stress reactions, shin pain could be even shin splints, um, bursitis, compartment syndromes, hip labral tears, low back pain, um, tendonitis, ankle sprains. You may or may not see menstrual dysfunction. It could be a delayed menarche also, which um, might uh, kind of throw you off track a little bit as well. But as the amount of available energy in relationship to training diminishes, um, the athletic performance worsens, there are more body systems affected more severely by this. So the cause of the orthopedic directly, uh, injury directly is typically um, a form of overuse. So as you run, as you with lift weights, as you're doing anything athletic, you're causing microtrauma. That microtrauma is to the bones, to the joints, to the tendons, to the ligaments. And when you rest from sports, that's when the body repairs itself. So there's this breaking down 
and building up. And that's the whole purpose of going to the gym to build more muscle. You cause a little bit of breaking down of that muscle and the muscle protects itself by hypertrophy. And that's how the muscle gets stronger. Similarly with bone, as you are increasing your training program, hopefully gradually, the bone is responding to that new stress that's put on it. And assuming it has enough rest, it will actually hypertrophy the bone and help it withstand that stress from the athletic activity. But if you have diminished reparative ability, or if the training overwhelms your ability to repair, that's when um, you will get overuse injuries as a result, when you can't adapt to these stresses that you're putting on uh, the body. So normally, again, bone will adapt to these changes in load, um, changes in frequency of load, especially if they occur gradually. So what you might have been doing in your spring track would be absolutely fine because you've been training the whole season and then you decide that you're going to work this summer and you get your summer job scooping ice cream at the ice, at the ice cream shop locally and you kind of take your summer off from running and then you start your cross country season and suddenly even though it was less than you were doing last spring suddenly you're developing pain uh, you're finding your running times are diminishing and you have a stress fracture but you were doing less than before uh, but what happened was the adaptations you developed from the spring season diminished and you increased your training too quickly for the body to readapt. And now you've exceeded your body's reparative ability and a stress fracture can develop. And that's what this picture is. It's not uh, abundantly obvious per se, looking at an x-ray that a stress fracture is there. It might be a subtle um, cloudiness to the bone that you can perhaps appreciate um, this sort of subtle cloudy line going across the distal tibia. Um, it could be some thickening of the um, periosteal reaction around the bone, um, but it is not an acute trauma. And it is a sort of an achy pain that typically comes on pretty quickly with athletic participation uh, once it's present. It responds, of course, very well to rest because rest is what it needs to repair itself. Um, and the pain is also responsive to, uh, to NSAIDs. So in the treatment of Red S, the goal is to enable the athlete to participate in the sport they enjoy, but at a safe and appropriate level so that they have sufficient energy to support their athletic performance. And, you know, that sounds, of course, straightforward, except when the athlete doesn't quite share that goal. And that would be most common in a lot of sports like cross country running, where they really feel like they must continue in gymnastics or figure skating or dip ballet, where they are encouraged to um, have a certain aesthetic to their body that supports low caloric intake. And it, it's almost a, can be even like a brainwashing in that sport that they must diminish how much energy they are intaking, um, even though it's in it's um, inhibiting from the, them from reaching their maximum potential in their sport. So depending upon the athlete's level of risk, they may need to stop training for a while and or cut back on the training until they are healthy, till they have those energy levels so that they can um, progress in their sport and not impair other bodily functions. They also should have an eating plan designed to rebuild their strength uh, and vitality. And sometimes in these sev in severe cases where there is an eating disorder in particular, they may need inpatient treatment for this. And treatment may take a prolonged period of time, impacting their ability to participate in the sports that they, um, that they enjoy. So it is a group group effort, a multidisciplinary approach. So you need the main physician to um, both monitor their improvement and coordinate care. Dietitian is a very important part of this who will work with athletes to um, and you'll understand both their feelings about food and also teach them and instruct them on how to reach their training goals and do it in a healthy way. 
um, psychologist or psychotherapist who will address the psychological issues, whether they be societal or um, OCD or other psychological issues that may contribute to their um, unhealthy eating or their eating habits. And then to address the injuries themselves, a sports medicine physician or orthopedist and a very important role in the physical therapist and helping them um, gradually return to their sports in a healthy way that minimizes their risk of another overuse type injury. So when somebody does have an overuse uh, injury, so the orthopedic part of this, but whether it even be red S or just an overuse injury in general, um, rest from that aspect of the sport is such an, is really the key factor. If something is used too much, then you've got to use it less for them to, for it to heal. So it doesn't necessarily mean staying out of sports in the cross country runner with a stress fracture in the tibia, it might mean bicycling instead cross country, sorry, uh, could be an elliptical machine, potentially even or swimming is great. In the baseball player, it might be playing in the field instead of pitching, it might be DHing if they really can't throw. So there are ways to keep them active and work around the restrictions that they need in order for them to heal from whatever injury and cross training, which I just alluded to is a very um, important part of that. So again, swimming for the cross country runner, um, using different muscles in different ways so that you're enhancing your athleticism overall and not just doing the same thing again and again, which again, will often lead to an overuse injury. And NSAIDs are typically useful in diminishing pain, diminishing the inflammation that occurs with overuse injury. And physical therapy is a vital part of it because the best way to get an overuse injury is to go back to a sport full steam after you've recovered from an overuse injury. Because now again, your body has adapted to a period of rest and you're primed for an overuse injury upon your return. So that's where physical therapy in particular can be very helpful because they will help to guide the athlete to gradually building back up into their particular sport. So girls don't always have things worse and I will quickly go uh, move on from this slide so I don't get written up for this talk. And shifting focus now to the boys, not the ACL, but the UCL, the ulnar collateral ligament. Um, this is in regard to, there are multiple UCLs, there's a UCL of the thumb. This is in regard to the UCL of the elbow. And this has become an epidemic in baseball, starting as young as the little leaguers and particularly as you're getting into high school and college levels. So in your little leaguers, it's not the UCL directly, but it's often the medial epicondyle and the growth plate that sustain the stress that's put across it from pitching. So when a child is in Little League, when their physis are open, that growth plate is the weakest link. And so when they start getting overuse injuries from pitching and throwing, it's going to typically be around the growth plate until they're approaching skeletal maturity. So if I see a child at that age, and I often do, I make sure that they have an understanding that they shouldn't be throwing through pain, that they have to work on the strength of their arm and most importantly, have adequate rest to protect their arm. So I tell them, you know, little league, you get a free pass, bone heals. It will be absolutely fine. It won't cause any long-term problems, but it's a lesson that you're on the track to those long-term problems and that they have to change course now in order to avoid that. So you're throwing sports where you have um, your most, you, or your, th your sports where you have the most overuse UCL injuries are baseball and football. Wrestling does have a lot of UCL injuries, but they are more acute trauma. And typically those can be treated conservatively because you don't have that gradual attenuation of the UCL causing instability to the elbow. Now I looked for data on javelin throwers because UCL injuries on in javelin throwers are actually called javelins elbow. And they're not called that in baseball players, of course, even though it's the same pathology, but 
There are similar numbers of male and female javelin throwers, unlike baseball and football and wrestling for that matter. So I tried to look up if there is a higher rate in one gender versus another, but surprisingly, there are not that many studies on javelin throwers. And um, most of them, despite following a number of athletes, don't seem to mention uh, what gender these athletes are. But if somebody happens to know of a study, please do send it my way. And again, these injuries are due to repetitive valgus stress on the medial inner side of the elbow. And you can see in these charts just how the epidemic of needing UCL reconstruction um, has just skyrocketed, skyrocketed exponentially. So when someone has a UCL injury, they typically present with pain on the medial aspect of the elbow. They are often feeling that pain during the acceleration phase of throwing. The patient is usually, if not skeletally mature, then approaching skeletal maturity. So they're at the point where the physis is not playing into things anymore and it's not the weakest link in the chain. They will typically very gradually lose throwing velocity and control of their pitches. In more advanced cases, they'll get some paresthesias in the ulnar two digits because as more valgus stress is placed across the elbow, um, that elbow, like I said, that ligament starts to attenuate and you start to get stretch across the ulnar nerve and you'll start to get ulnar nerve symptoms. If the elbow is inflamed, um, you will lose full range of motion of the elbow. And this can also be an acute on chronic injury, which is often quite traumatic where they've had this chronic medial elbow pain. They continue to throw through it and then they get a sudden pop while they're throwing and that's their UCL just, just going. So this shows the throwing motion and the throwing motion is broken up into stages. And when you are at that late cocking to acceleration phase, the rate of elbow extension, so rotation going forward of that arm in your professional baseball players is 2,400 degrees per second. So extraordinarily fast. It is actually the fastest human motion is throwing a baseball at the professional level. Your javelin throwers, your top javelin throwers are not that far behind. It's 1,900 uh, angular degrees per second. And it's probably because the, the javelin um, may weigh differently than the baseball. Um, there's approximately 64 Newton meters of force applied to the elbow during that throw. And so that's equivalent to holding 60 pounds in your hand in that late cocking position. So the forces across the elbow are um, particularly substantial. So prevention is key because once you started that down that road of attenuating that UCL, it, it really doesn't repair itself. It only goes from bad to worse. So again, gradually ramping up, particularly in the spring is so important. You don't go in full force day one, you gradually increase the intensity, um, the duration of practices, the frequency, stretching, before and after is also important. You wanna loosen up those muscles. You don't want any tightness to impair how you're throwing the ball. Um, strengthening, I feel is really one of the key components to staying healthy when, when you pitch. So what I find when I have a, a high schooler or a little leaguer in my office with elbow pain is that it is very rare where I don't find strength deficits in the arm. And typically it's strength deficits in the shoulder, particularly in shoulder abduction and shoulder external rotation. And so when you are throwing a baseball, it's a very coordinated series of steps that transfer energy from the legs to the torso and out the arm. And if there's any, any weak link in that, then there's gonna be more stress on the next step down the line. So if you have weakness in your shoulder, you are going to put increased strain on your elbow. And that weakness is again, due to that micro trauma that builds up during the season. 
and your younger players, they may be training surprisingly intensely in terms of throwing and pitching, but much less so in terms of strengthening. So they're really not addressing the weakness that develops. And so I'm seeing kids as young as age 10, which means they've been pitching maybe two, two years, maybe three at most, where I actually see changes in their medial epicondyle on x-ray, whether it be hypertrophy or even some spurring type formation uh, in the bone or widening of the medial epicondyle. And even more important than the strength, strengthening, rest, 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 rest. They must give their bodies time to recover from this particularly forceful motion. So in helping to prevent these injuries, they should have a coach um, evaluate their form, see if their throwing mechanics are off, which they often are when they're younger. If they're throwing particularly fast, uh, especially the younger kids, that form has to be that much better to withstand the amount of force they're putting across their, their arm. Um, so you can have a kid who throws lightly with terrible mechanics and never have a problem. And a kid with better mechanics, um, but throwing hard such that it's just too much force across the elbow. And even though their mechanics are better, they have to be even better than that to withstand that force. Uh, many of these kids are playing on two teams at the same time. So while they may be following pitch counts for one team, their parents or their coaches might not be monitoring the, the days of rest or pitch counts for the other team. And it is so important to avoid early sports specialization. So early sports specialization is playing the same sport nine months of the year to the exclusion of other sports. Your best athletes, when you get to college, um, even high school, college, professional, are multi-sport athletes. There are plenty of Major League Baseball players out there who are offered sports scholarships in football or basketball. And it's because the athleticism from one sport changes, uh, sorry, it gives you an, an advantage in another sport, but without the same type of movement, so a diminished risk of overuse injury. Um, they should never be throwing when fatigued. That's when the mechanics break down and they put increased stress on their elbow. And I know I already mentioned it, but I'm mentioning it again because it is the most important thing. And that is rest if they are having pain. There are so many kids I see who, if they rested when they started having pain, if the pain was going on for two or three days and they just rested it, they could have been playing again in a week, maybe even less. Um, but what they do is they wait either till they can't throw anymore or they wait till their season is over. And then they come in with such an inflamed elbow that now they need six weeks, three months of rest before they're ready to return. So that's my biggest take home uh, on that. So the treatment again is primarily conservative until you've reached that point of, of no return. So rest, NSAIDs to diminish inflammation, compression, stretching from roller, PT, building up that strength around the shoulder in particular, but the whole arm, the scapular stabilizers, the trunk, the core, everything goes into pitching or throwing. Um, the coach, again, should me check mechanics and form, and not just your parent coach, but if a kid is really interested in pitching, they should have a professional coach take a look at them. And then again, the gradual return when pain-free. Um, UCL reconstruction surgery, Tom and John surgery is when, again, that ligament has gotten to the point where it's too attenuated and all of these other conservative measures will not um, help you anymore going forward. So Betty White had her own particular take on the difference between girl and boys. And I will leave you with that. And I will also change off this slide before I get written up for something. And that is all I have. These are my own personal male and female athletes, my son uh, and my daughter who, yes, does play baseball. You cannot say softball in front of her or she will get very, very un um, unhappy with you. Thank you very much. Awesome. We do have a few questions queued up. Uh, before we get started, we do want to encourage people to please submit their questions in the Q&A box. 
With that being said, uh, one of the first questions, what are the best ways to prevent injury in women versus men? Is there a major difference in preventative medicine between the genders? I think that mostly goes back to, to the ACLs in terms of difference. And that is the neuromuscular training makes a big difference in your female athletes, but in anything else, it's really the same. And that is building up gradually, making sure your body has adequate nutrition, adequate rest. So for the red S yes, you'll see that more in girls, but really the treatment and the approach to it is essentially the same in males versus females. So regardless of, of gender, it's you know, rest, make sure that your body has adequate nutrition and your know, training adequate strength so that when you are doing a sport that requires a lot of forceful movement, um, that you have the muscle strength to support your joints. Thank you. Next question. Is there a major psychological difference between male and female eating disorders? Does bone loss occur differently or at a, a different rate? Um, so psychological differences is a little out of the scope. I just touch on it being a factor, but it's really not my expertise. So I'm going to refrain from commenting on that. Um, but in terms of um, bone loss, at least in the adolescent, young adult population, there's no significant difference that I see in terms of the, the rate of bone loss between um, male and, and female athletes. And usually they're at, they're at an age where they're packing on the bone and not really losing the bone. The bone, bone loss generally occurs or bone density loss generally occurs from disuse. So anybody who is um, resting from an injury is going to have rapid bone loss. There aren't great studies on bone density and bone loss in children because those are generally evaluated via x-ray. And you can't expose kids to unnecessary x-ray to um, put together studies to evaluate bone density and bone loss because the x-ray is detrimental. Great. Um, do you have any last closing comments or remarks before we close out? Um, well, thank you for, for the questions, for your time. And I hope that, that this was um, useful in, in some way. Excellent. On behalf of Atlantic Health System, Morristown Medical Hospital, Pediatric Orthopedics, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. You will now be redirected to the post-event survey requesting your feedback. Please take a moment to complete this survey to receive credit for providing feedback and attending today's webinar. This concludes today's stream. Thank you. Have a great day.